Hey everyone, today we're going to talk about a very, very cool, very, very useful concept in data science called the partial dependence plot. So where this comes in really handy, in my experience, is in bridging that gap between you being the data scientist or the statistician who understands some models pretty well, uh, and you having to kind of convey those results about how your model works and why it does what it does to other people in your organization, your company, who maybe don't have as much data experience or understand the mathematics of these models. I really think this is something they should teach more in schools or at least emphasize more, which is that we're, as data scientists, we're not just concerned with like how the models work. Of course, that's very important. But at the end of the day, we need to take our results and package them in such a way that people who maybe aren't as data savvy can understand so that we can actually get our projects out there in the wild. So this is going to be a big service to that goal. So we're going to have a real world situation. Let's say you have the good fortune of being a data scientist for the NBA, the National Basketball Association. Got a basketball right here. Hopefully you like my art skills. And let's say you were tasked with creating a model which is going to take in some features about a basketball team at a certain point during the season and is going to build a model to predict whether or not the team will win their next game. So at a high level, we're just going to be considering these four features to keep things simple for today. We have the number of games they've won so far, the number of games they've lost so far, the number of injuries on the team in total, and the total number of years of experience of all the players on the team. We use these four features, feed it into some model here, and we get some predicted probability p hat, which is the probability that we think the team will win their next game. Pretty easy to understand. Now, let's say this model is doing well by whatever metrics you're choosing, accuracy, precision, recall, whatever. And we bring this model to the board, to some people who are going to decide whether or not to use it for some purposes. And they have this question. They're a little bit skeptical, as they should be, because, I mean, they don't really understand how it works. So they come to you and say that, hmm, we're not really sure how the model works. Can you at least tell us how each feature affects the final predicted probability? So how does the number of games won affect the final predicted probability? How does the number of games the team lost affect the final predicted probability? If you're able to give us a better understanding of that, we would feel more comfortable using this model in practice. And that is kind of why I've drawn this model M in this black box. That's not an accident. A lot of times in machine learning, we talk about models being a black box, where uh, either even the person who created it doesn't fully understand how it works just because there's so many complex things going on, or maybe the person who's created it does pretty much understand it, but for people who are not as data savvy, it's a black box. So either way, it's a problem because as humans, we have kind of a natural skepticism towards letting machines do the deciding. So we need to feel comfortable about how the machine is doing the deciding. And that's where the partial dependence block comes in. So we're, again, we're trying to answer this question about how do each of the four features by themselves affect the final predicted probability. And this is the simple process we go through. We'll talk about how it works, and then we'll talk about some of the big disadvantages. But also, we'll talk about the advantages through the process too. So the first thing is you take your original data set because although I didn't say it, we assume there's some data set with these four features and many different basketball teams for the observations, and we create some artificial data. So the specific question we're trying to answer right now is how does the number of games that the team won, the first feature over here, how does that feature affect the final predicted probability? So we do a very intuitive thing. Let's say that the number of games the team won ranges between 0 and 5. So it can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. We take our data set and we artificially set all of this column, which is the number of games won, to be 0. Now let me emphasize that point. Before we tampered with the data set, there was some natural numbers in these columns, either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. The first step is to artificially set all of these to 0. Then what we do, step 2, is we calculate the predicted probability for each of these samples. So we look at the first basketball team, who we've set to have zero games won, and the rest of the data has not been meddled with. That's still the same. And we calculate the predicted probability now. For the next team, we calculate the predicted probability of winning their next game. And we do that for every single team in our data set. So at the end, we have these n predicted probabilities, and we simply just take the average of those predicted probabilities and what does that number represent? That number is meant to represent what is the on average predicted probability of winning your next basketball game if you have zero games won so far. 
So the reason that that is the explanation for this number is that we look at the whole data set and we consider every single sample as having zero games won. So we're basically saying in a population of teams who haven't won any games because we've artificially set that to be so, what is the average predicted probability? And it's probably kind of low because we expect that if you haven't won anything so far, we don't have a lot of evidence to say you're going to win something next. Now you can probably see the next step coming. The next thing we do is we artificially set all of these to be one and then we calculate the average predicted probability under the assumption that you've won one game. Then we set all of them to be two, set all of them to be three, four, and five, and we get the average predicted probability in each case. So that's step two, is artificially tampering with the data set and setting the whole column to be each of these possible numbers, and then calculating the average predicted probability or the average score that's output by the model in each of those cases. Then the third step is actually creating the partial dependence plot, which is pretty simple. We just plot the number of games won, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, against each of the numbers we get by artificially setting this first column to each of those. And we would get something probably that looks like this, which shows exactly what the board was asking for. If we come back to the board and show them this plot and say that this is how the number of games won affects the predicted probability of winning your next game, that makes a whole lot of sense. That helps interpret the model a lot better for people who aren't very data savvy or even yourself if you don't understand the model. Because this says that the more games you win, this is how the predicted probability is going to go up for winning your next game. And that is pretty nice to look at, pretty uh, intuitive in understanding how the model works. And then we just repeat. So you can probably just see where we're going with this, but we just apply the same technique to each of these other columns. So for example, let's say we're trying to understand how the number of injuries affects the predicted probability of winning the next game. So let's say the number of injuries ranges between 0 and 10, for example. Then you would just set this whole column to be 0, calculate the average probability here, set the whole column to be 1, and so on. And you'll probably get a plot that looks like this, where the more injuries you have, on average, you're going to have a less probability of winning your next game because your players are injured. And similar plots here. So that's really the power of these partial dependence plots, this partial dependence analysis, is that we take the original data set and we just do some transformations to it, we tamper with it in a very productive way in order to understand the effect of the final score output by the model, this p hat, by changing each of the variables independently. Now that we understand what a partial dependence plot is and how we derive one and what it's used for, let us talk about something very important, which, which I really want you to take home at the end of this video which is the big disadvantages of using a partial dependence plot. Some of you who are skeptical of this analysis are rightly skeptical. Let me talk about some of the big disadvantages. The biggest one, by far, is that this assumes that your features are independent. Let's look at a quick case study. So we have number of games won and number of games lost in the season so far. Now, if we have all these uh, data points at around the same time in the season, then the sum of these two things in the original data is probably going to be the same number because all the teams have probably played a similar number of games so far and they've either won the game or lost the game. So if we add up these two features, they should pretty much add up to close to the same numbers for every single team. And so by setting this entire column to be zero and doing nothing to this column, we artificially create a data set that probably can never exist in the real world because this would say that the team has played two games. This would say the team has played three games if we add up those two numbers. This would say the team has played zero games. So this data set is kind of inconsistent with reality. And the reason it's inconsistent with reality is because this partial dependence analysis we just talked about very heavily relies on this assumption that the features are independent. That artificially setting one feature to some value doesn't create any impossibilities or improbabilities based on other features in the data. And for any real world data science project, we know that a lot of your features are gonna be correlated with each other. That's just kind of the nature of data that you collect. And so while that doesn't exclude the ability to use partial dependence analysis, it is something to keep in your mind. So that's the biggest thing to think about. There is um, other disadvantages. For example, you notice here, we just take an average of all these p-values and the average kind of blurs out some of the important uh, deviation we might see for example, it would be important or cool to see the fact that all of these predicted probabilities are very spread out versus them being really close to each other. And maybe in both those cases, the average ends up being the same, but we kind of erase that standard deviation effect. So 
that is something you can remedy. You can just show a distribution for each of these instead of just a single point estimate. So that's just something you can add on to a partial dependence plot. All right, so I really just wanted to get those cautions out there because I don't want to make this seem like a silver bullet to interpreting a model. I do want to say there's certain disadvantages that you should be aware of. Um, but there are ways to fix those disadvantages. But the main thing I wanted to get across is that the partial dependence plot, this partial dependence analysis is a crucial tool in the data scientist tool belt for helping both themselves and most importantly others in the organization feel more comfortable about how the model actually works, how each of these different inputs to the model affects the final output of the model. That can be the make or break for whether your model is going to be adopted in the real world or not. Part of being a data scientist is helping sell this thing you've created, helping people understand how it works. So if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe, and I will see you next time.